Well, hello, creatives, community, kind folks out there. Welcome to the channel. Uh, this week, we are talking about, of all things, transhuman theories and how we can use that in our tabletop RPG uh, role playing games. Now, why are we talking about that in particular? Well, we talk about a lot of subjects. Uh, normally, we take that subject and stretch it out all week uh, for where we'll take that subject, whatever it may be, for Monster Monday, um, Discord Tuesday, and of course today is World Building Wednesday. Uh, we will continue on with Third Pillar Thursday, Third Pillar of Exploration, and Future Friday. But today, today we are continuing our talks about um, our modern thoughts about what the future brings for us in terms of uh, post-humanism and um, and uh, transhumanism, uh, human plus, whatever that case may be. And how does that relate to, say, some of our more uh, common role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons? Well, we're going we're gonna to get into that. So the idea behind this, uh, if you've taken a look at the, at the thumbnail, would be the idea of post-scarcity. Uh, what is post-scarcity? And also, I uh, I continued on saying universal basic income, which in itself can be a little bit contentious. Um, when it comes to transhuman thinking, there is an idea out there that um, we will eventually get to the point where we live in a post-scarce civilization. Post-scarcity means a, a situation in which we have a lack of um, need for survival in terms of resources, uh, at least practically speaking, functionally speaking. So post-scarcity is when the resources that we need to survive, food, shelter, uh, water, um, even basic, uh, basic modes of transportation are uh, clothing and maybe even um, limited amounts of of communication amongst us all, um, the things that fulfill us are no longer scarce. And so in our own, own society, uh, we have to work in order to obtain resources to use, spend, and uh, deviate, um, divvy out those resources to acquire other resources for us to live. Uh, we, we work to have a job. We use that job to pay for shelter. We, we pay for our food. Um, we pay for our education. We pay for our entertainment. And so the purpose of essentially working is to work to get resources, to use those resources to find other things. In a much more uh, feudal um, ancient society, Scott, what's going on there, man? In a more feudal society, we had barter, in which case people would work, say, on a farm or um, using their skills to uh, make objects, whether it's leatherworking or carpentry or something, and then they would trade those objects for other things that they need in their life. Post-scarcity is the idea of, uh, and much of our fantasy and science fiction in which there is it's almost the elimination of uh, monetary value itself. Now you can go extremely far and just have, <laughs> it's, it's like Star Trek, right? You go to a machine and you say, uh, Earl Grey, hot, and you receive this cup of hot Earl Grey. And that, that is the, <laughs> the extent to the resources you need to expend to receive, to uh, obtain these, these objects or whatever you need to live. So post-scarcity is the elimination of the need uh, of the scarceness of whatever it is you need to serve, to live in life. Um, you need food, food is readily available, uh, shelter, shelter is available, and maybe even other elements that we have in our lives, whether it's clothing, entertainment, uh, communication um, um, amongst the people that you have in your life. Without a need to to expend resources to obtain it without you needing to to work for it or without you needing to you know go to a nine to five or yourself needing to to uh, scramble uh, whether it's hunting or gathering or or what have you now how do we use that for tabletop role playing games kind of seems a little bit like 
boring, I suppose, on its surface. Like, okay, wow, it's everyone has every all of their needs met. Great. But I think we could pull in some, we can use that and pull in some of those threads, especially when we think about both uh, uh, far future and fantasy role playing games. Um, where would it come from? Like, how would you, how would any society get to that point? And then come up with ways to pull in the threads of, okay, the, the circumstances that lead to a, a society that has everything they need. Uh, did one element give it to them? Did they work for this? Are they, um, are they the cattle of the world? Are these things given to them because of an outside force? Um, th those kind of things. And so I think we can really think about that. So we, we, we know of ourselves of imagining the far future where you have, say, like nanotech machines or microfabs or, uh, you know, the Star Trek machines. You press a button, ask for what you want, and, and boom, you got it, right? <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, above above all the needs met hierarchy is the I need it all hierarchy. Yeah. Now, now again, see, I think Scott kind of Scott Poe kind of brings up a particular subject. Like, um, is, is this culture new? Because the moment I believe a society achieves this, there's going to be a lot of people who are like, oh, I can get anything I want. Great. And they start rubbing their fingers like, wow, if I, it's like a, it's like the wish fulfillment, right? If you rub the genie's lamp and the genie gives you immediately gives you three wishes, you're like, yeah, yeah well, I can't wait to get my wishes. But five generations in, it might be struggable, right? Like, yeah, I don't need, you know, do I, it, since, since everything I need is available when I want it, do I really need to ask for everything I want all the time? And, and eventually it would be like, you know, no. Um, ask anyone who, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right, hi. Um, I, I don't know how to pronounce the exclamation points, but thank you. That's right. Um, that's right. Says urge to build something. Yeah. And so the first generation, you're going to get the, the mad scientist thing, like, <laughs> you know, twirling the mustache, right? <laughs> it's dogs. Dog. Ah, I think we all could. We're all dogs, right? <laughs> What's up dog. Um, the, the urge to build something and it may not be, it may not be um, self-fulfillment. It may be something to build, right? It says, I would want to build something, build something grand. It could be something artistic. Building, people would, may want to build something that will last, last forever. I hear you, like, for posterity. Is it building a bridge across, like, let's say, take our own world. Is it building a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean? Is it... Um, building a haven for the, the the people that maybe live in this world where others do not exist is it is it oh uh, building something that's like the pyramids i hear you like is it carving the face of someone famous you know into the side of a giant mountain uh oh hey what's going on dogs bollocks what's going i did i did not realize that um Thank you. <laughs> uh, but but you're fine. You you are no longer that individual. <laughs> you're that's right. Um, so what do you do in a post? What do people do in a post scarce uh, civilization? All right. So the simple idea would be they would just be a bunch of bored sheep just walking around in, you know, silver, silver lame outfits with nothing around them. But I find that you probably find people doing things if you can, if all of your needs are met, some would say that a part portion of the population would get extremely lazy. It would be like the like the movie Wally, or or the the um or the idea. Ah, this whole channel is kind of dedicated to RPGs, but I but but you can absolutely have your you you are um uh you absolutely have your own uh, opinion. So yeah. What? It's strange. <laughs> but the idea would be that there's an idea that some people would be lazy and never do anything since they never have to work. And in, in our modern context, there are people who believe that. And then there's 
just as probably just as many people who believe the stream opposite that if you were to remove the struggles it takes to live out of people's lives um the entire population of a like a a city, a country, um, a nation, the entire world, that people would eventually fall into categories um, where they would want to achieve things greater than themselves, that uh, they would want to explore or study or teach. Um, yeah. <laughs> so an idea you can, I think we can pull from this when it comes to say fantasy gaming. Um, how, where does post scarcity fit in in fantasy gaming? Well, it, it, some people have thought that um, magic spells, right, create food and water, good berry, um, of course, create water itself. Um, thaumaturgy and prestidigitation, um, druid craft, those uh, mage hand, even <laughs> minor illusion. Um, uh, I've never seen Spaceship Crash TV, Pallor. I'll have to look that up. I've never heard of that. Um, but the idea would be that we, it, you know, magic it, in it in and of itself kind of can and could create a post-scarce civilization. And, you know, of course, the role-playing game is very neutral. Um, oh, like Car Crash TV, but in space. <laughs> I, I hear you. I, I, I get the reference now. Yeah, I mean, there's a possibility that that the spells that exist in the game already, if you took it and extrapolated it out, people wouldn't have to farm any longer. If you have people lo looking into the sky and going, um, with my divine power, I give you food and water. And everyone's like, cool. Are you going to do this every day? And they go, um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Great. I love good berries. They they're they're awesome. <laughs> and everyone's walking around with like purple fluid on their chins because they just eat good berries all day long and never need to work. And then you you, you some would say there's a horror in that, right? In a, in a medieval style world where people don't no longer farm, uh they they no longer hunt and gather, you know, what happens to those individuals? Now, if um taking that even further, there, like for example, in Pathfinder, the Inner Sea Guide, there is a there is a island controlled by a gold dragon, and it's almost like a eugenics program by this uh, gold dragon, and the gold dragon is trying to. Um, it it seems as if there's a a a project for the gold dragon to cultivate the humanity that lives there into the, the perfect people and takes care of them and protects them and educates them. And uh, we don't know, might be breeding them to be the, the epitome of what humanity should be. And in many ways, that's where you get like post scarcity. So where does it come from? Now the insidious part of that, we can, we can always go towards the insidious portion. Um, are the people being, is it like, uh, the, um, oh, the HG Wells story, um, time travel where, where th th their humanity is being bred simply as cattle. So keeping their lives clean and efficient and letting them, you know, have parties in the park every day, you know, is, uh, are they in a, um, is the membrane between worlds thin enough that say fey creatures have done this and giving humanity everything they want for the purpose of having these parties and maybe even breeding with humanity? Is there a, a, a powerful creature or entity such as like, <laughs> yeah, Scott Pose says free range human cattle. Yeah. I mean, are, are there fiendish creatures that are, that are, uh, portraying themselves as the guardians of a section of humanity. And, you know, they, they look uh, like angelic figures just to keep humanity in check so that they can be used to feed uh, greater evils, much like say, for example, mind flayers or something, mind flayers using illusions and other things, you know, they could care less what people 
the mind flayers, the illithids may care less about uh, them eating the people. It's more about using illusions and um, other uh, aspects to pacify humanity so that they can be used or something. So we've, we've have, we have that. It could even be celestials, celestials coming down from the sky to protect humanity and give them everything they want. And then they realize that they're in caught in this loop because people cannot survive on their own. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. It says who wants to physically do dishwashing? Screw that. <laughs> yeah. Um, definitely. Especially when you could just go like, listen, I just need my food, my plate. That's it. I'm throwing it back into the recycler, right? So, but pulling on the other strings, because this kind of makes humanity seem uh, kind of weak, kind of like, mm, once you give everybody everything that they want, eh, it's like, well, there's nothing else for them to do except just sit around and party. Well, the opposite of that may be true in the sense of, now people have have lots of time to build great works, whether it's um, artistic works, exploration. Um, you, you know, for the person who wants to exercise, you can you can literally do whatever you want. It twitches the nose. It's, it's like doing doing the um, <laughs> doing the um, um, Samantha from Bewitched, where you can just. Uh, call upon anything you want or what's the other one the other old show um uh darren was from bewitched um oh the genie uh, the genie television show oh come on <laughs> um uh, there's the other one but anyway it's it's the idea of like uh, your your wish is my command i dream of genie that thank you geez of course i dream of genie yeah i dream of genie where you just like Yes, master, and then it's boom, you know, um, and all of a sudden create what you want. And so when you have that power available to you, what do you do with it? Do you do you go on a mission to help others? Do, you know, do you do people become bored and decide to do things even though they know that they can create things on their own? For example, let's take Star Trek in Star Trek. Anyone can probably go to a replicator and just create their Earl Grey hot, but they like the social interaction of going to 10 forward and drinking and eating with everyone else, including the individuals there. <laughs> I dream of genie with the light brown hair. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the idea is people still want things. They want social interaction. There are people who want to cook meals for other others and serve them. Um, you know, uh, that's right, says, uh, I like Guinan. And Guinan wants to help people with their their problems. So things that physically uh, help us may be possible. Okay, you, you go somewhere, you get the thing. Maybe in this, maybe in a medieval society, there's like good berry trees or something, and you just go and grab as many as you need for whatever the case might be. But someone might, be, might say, well, I don't want to eat good berries for like, 500 years, I'd like to cook a meal. And as a matter of fact, I want to cook meals for other people too. Um, there are many people in our world who want to build things with their hands. They want to walk and travel instead of flying a plane. Or if, if, if someone had the means to do it, there are many people who wouldn't sail around the world or climb the highest mountains. Um, there are people who would, who would love to work together to exercise and achieve physical perfection. Uh, there are many individuals out there who would want to study cures for many diseases and, you know, create methods where, um, Hey Vince, what's going on? Oh, well, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday there, man. Um, yeah, it's like, it, it's <laughs> the idea of, of the idea of, um, it, and it, I, I see a ball friend. I dream a genie as well in, in the, uh, in the discord chat. Uh, and again, I have to remind you for those who don't know fantasy grounds, discord, uh, fantasy grounds, college rule discord. Um, if you join fantasy grounds college and you would like to learn how to use fantasy grounds, you can go over there, um, hook up with a bunch of the administrators, hang out with a bunch of the students, but 
Uh, once you've done all that, you can hang out at the Fantasy Grounds College Boiler Room. Once you join their Discord, just slide down on, on the left and go into the Boiler Rooms. And that's where we simulcast this, uh, this show here. Now, um, you oh, you know another person that hangs out with us is having their birthday? Yeah. <laughs> so... Oh really? Oh wow! Well, hap happy birthday to you! Happy pre-birthday, uh, Palora as well. I, I did not know that. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, um, uh, Scott Post says this society put all their effort into the great computer, a precursor to the paranoia setting. <laughs> yeah, um, which which is another thing, right? The people could be trying to achieve a greater level of perfection for their society, such as as pushing, um pushing forward in a far future, pushing forward the idea of literally um, a godhead AI and uh, the great computer, something that literally oversees everything and everyone. Or, for example, in, say, a medieval uh, arcane setting, there could be a desire to find, um, to protect everyone from all the dangers that are out there. There may be people who would literally um, give of their lives, you know, service to protect the community that gives them so much. Um, I'm sure there would, today we have people who uh, give of themselves to protect people, firefighters, police, military, teachers, uh, doctors, things of that nature. I don't believe that would go away, but I think the processes would be different. Also, um, yeah, put everyone in the matrix. <laughs> Everyone's equal and need nothing anymore, which which is a possibility as well. We, we're going to talk about virtual reality in the future, but yeah, um, uh, and and it's a possibility when we we're going to talk about this in virtual reality. But there also may be a dissonance involved in it. Um, it, it depending on the f how high fidelity a virtual reality world is it, people may reject it even even if it's good because of its like limited scope or there could be a portion of the population that for some reason just it just doesn't feel right it's the um uncanny valley idea um <laughs> how open the pod bay door how no dave i can't do that <laughs> Uh yeah, if it's just no one said anything about liking it. Yeah, that's the whole matrix idea. Like, no, you're I'm I'm gonna save your life and make you live forever. I don't care. Yeah, Vince says you can have post-scarcity without everyone being happy. And I wanted to point that out, right? Just because even today, we have people who we know of stories of people who, in our estimation, have everything and they hate it and they act out because of having all of that. Um, much of that has to do with people who are very rich and famous, um, sports players, um, actors, uh, just the idle rich who get to the point where they are not comfortable in their like own skin. They don't like the attention that they receive. Um, they don't know what to do they're so idle. They don't know what to do with their, with themselves. And, um, so I, I, I would, I would say that I think it's, I, th I think we're very much heading towards that post scarcity. I mean, I still got to, I still work six days a week, which kind of, you know, kind of sucks, but, but I know that co in comparison to other cultures, I mean, I have the ability to go to a, to, to, find as much food and, and go certain places and shelter. And, you know, each, each of us carries around pretty much uh, a device that gives us all the information of the entire wealth of human culture. But because we have the entire knowledge of, of the world in our hands, how many people absorb all that information, right? It's in my hand, so I know I have access to it. So I don't use it, right? I could learn brain surgery, maybe. <laughs> I could learn genetic engineering, maybe. I could, you know, I, there's many things I could learn about on my phone, but I don't do it because that part of society in my hand is like post-scarce in a way. Uh, it's within reach, so do I reach for it? Um, 
uh, Plurus is I'm, I'm enough of a motivated person that, that I can keep myself busy with post-scarcity, I think. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of weird to think about the fact of how would you, like, what would you do? In, in many ways, I, I suppose you, we can relate this, this kind of situation to if I won the lottery, whatever the giant size lottery is where you live, if I won a lottery of, you know, tens, hundreds of millions, you know, close to a billion dollars, what would I do with my life? And you, you get into the, those um, uh, cyclical conversations of I would pay all my bills off and I'd give some to charity and I'd help my family and friends and I would travel. And then, you, you know, then someone says, well, what do you do after that? And you go, well, I, I don't know. Um, I'd open a business. I'd don't, you know, maybe donate my time to help children in the hospital. I would tend a giant garden. Like, um, <laughs> does post scarcity equal pre pre DPJ? I guess you're thinking pre born. Yeah. Um, it, well, yeah. So, <laughs> I hear you, Balfred. Balfred says, I go on a quest to play all the RPGs. And, and you could play them forever, right? Like eight hours, eight to ten hours a day with food just brought to you. And the, the largest, highest uh, fidelity screen with all of your virtual tabletop uh, assets on it whenever you want it. And the, the outfits to go with it with all the sound effects and music and even even the scent, you could even have the scent. No, you could play role playing games in the locations around the world, or even other alien worlds that are emblematic of your role playing game. <laughs> All right, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's right. Says what does post scarce even mean? Uh, many of us don't. Right, we don't even understand. Yep, hire actors. <laughs> That's the range of hire actors to LARP with you. Yeah, you know what? This part of the adventure is in the jungle. Come on, guys, let's get in our private, private uh, aerodyne and go into the jungle and have our <laughs> have our game there. And like, you step through a portal and it's a vast desert. Come on, let's go to the desert. <laughs> sure, it's only gonna take us ten minutes. Let's get in our 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 automated aerodyne and take us to the to the vast desert. <laughs> have 30 foot dice just rolling out of giant machines off the back of one of those um those like three three to five story um uh, uh dump trucks that do mining just have like the dice in the back of those as like a dice tray or something <laughs> yep fire up the holodeck and also bring a lot of hand sanitizer and spray it down afterwards right so again star trek with the holodeck you know it's is you you can put in a program that allows you to live the life you want and apparently according to their uh, according to that intellectual property people aren't addicted to it because it's well it's within reach they they do work they they get on the starship and they go exploring but they also have access to a thing that allows them to be whoever and do whatever they want within uh these this holographic um realm and i in in fantasy role playing there could be this exact same thing right you could have communities where they go to uh the back room of oracles or it could just be right out front where you go into a a a a building which has rooms and each of the rooms has like a uh illusions that bring about exactly what you're you're thinking of and so you could temporarily just become you know a fiendish monster that lives in the nine hells temporarily <laughs> Oh, but, uh, yeah, Boffer says, well, Berkeley did have a holodeck addiction. So did, if you've watched the Orville, um, oh, one of the Mocklins, uh, mm, Bordis. Bordis had one as well. <laughs> a, a pretty adult addiction, I might add. Um, uh, Polaris says, why would anyone be hired? You could get people to LARP with you, but nobody needs money, so you can really hire people to do anything. You wouldn't even need to hire them. You just you just call on people who would love to do it in the first place, right? If you if no one is being hired to do anything, then the only people doing things are those people who want to do them in the first place. So I suppose you could you could use the air quotes hired, but I think you would probably get volunteers to help out. Um, 
That's right. Says DBJ. I want to understand what post scarce means. Uh, oh, you didn't jump in. Post scarce means that all of the needs of society are met without needing to expend the resources to do so. Um, if you need food, it's readily available. You need clothing, it's there. You need shelter, it's it's just given to you. Um, you you need to, to study something, anything, that information is presented to you. You need to communicate with anyone around the world for any reason, it's available to you. Post-scarce, now some people feel like post-scarce might be, might be connected to universal basic income, which is the idea that, that all of your dreams aren't met, but your minimums to survive are met. So everyone has a place to live. It might just be four walls. Everyone has clothing. It might just be plain jumpsuits or something. And everyone has food, and the food might be extremely basic. Uh, it might even be like soy soy bricks or something, right? So that would be minimum. That's That's kind of a far future version of universal basic income. In, in modern day, universal basic income is the idea that instead of taking taxes from people and social services and such, that you essentially pay everyone. Um, for here in the States, the idea would be you pay everyone like, I don't know, like $50,000 a year or something. You give everyone a check. I, I believe the minimum version some people think of is like $1,000 a month. Every individual of adult age gets $1,000 a month. And all of your, and yes, um, Barfin says, uh, all necessities are provided for. Medicine in, is included in that. Um, of course, safety. There's this, of course, public works for safety and things, clean water, uh, that that kind of thing. So, um. <laughs> Yeah, Tesla Radio says the Orville is Star Trek deconstructed. Of course it is. I, I love the Orville. I know pe people, it's a love-hate television show, but yeah. Um, Vince has just got a call. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> um, Vince says, I recently watched a video about the economics of Star Trek. So did I. Boy, we're in the same place. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um of uh, how do you trade with other factions? It, it, they actually explain in that video, uh, uh, Vince, um, in the sense that other, if you deal with people who do use money and trade, that you can take those trades, like the gold press latinum idea, that that the Federation could just accept the gold press latinum, trade resources, keep the latinum around, and when they deal with another culture that isn't post-scarce, they then give trade the latinum with the other people. So it's not that it, it's not that it, it's not the elimination of common sense. It's the elimination of this society uses a different method um, of, uh, uh, of using and disseminating and acquiring resources. Uh, we live in such a world where money and resources are so important that we can't imagine not needing it. So it's just a, it's an odd thing to think about, which is why people who are into post humanism and transhumanism would love to see it happen. But it, but again, it destroys our notion of many things. We talked about it destroying gender. It destroys what we think of ourselves as human when we become, if or when we become digital. Yeah, uh, Balfour says like the Ferengi. Yeah, you, you you deal in post, when you deal with people who still use an economic system of say like hyper-capitalism, you would just uh, you would just trade with them whatever they want because your society can can create what they want. So you make it. You you take their money. You give them what they need, and you just put the money in a in a box somewhere. <laughs> like we don't really need it. Um, yeah, uh, that's right. Says so. A socialist nightmare, and that's the that's the idea, right? Meaning like today people think of it being it being a nightmare, right? Well, it's socialism. There's just going to be laziness all around. And then there's another group of people that think, well, that's assuming that there are people who are working to give what they have to everyone else, right? If there is an external source, like, for example, AI and machines. And again, this is very difficult to imagine ourselves. And let's, because at some point, we feel in our modern society that automation will get to the point where there are going to be far too many people to employ to do other things because automation will have taken those those jobs away. Um, the, even the most minor of jobs, um, 
vehicles that drive themselves are going to put truck drivers and taxi drivers and Uber people out of out of commission. Um, mach machines that can cook and give you food, you won't need to use people in fast food restaurants. Uh, you have enough machines to cut grass and do lawn services and wash clothes and things on their own, then you don't need these people to do these smaller jobs. And then you start thinking, well, you still need people to be, to be educated to do other jobs. But if you have machines that have enough, um, enough detail to do, um, let's say, legal work or doctors and such eventually people are out of work and so the that's the fear the fear is you have all these people and there's no way to educate them smarter than the machines doing it for us so what do we do well then those machines just make everything for us and we live in a post scarce world so there's a lot of fear of like oh it's going to be a socialist nightmare because if everyone gets everything equally then what do people do for their time. Do they hang around? Do they play video games? You know, are they just going to be bored and get high on drugs? Um, the answer to that would be yes, but then there's going to be people who are like, who there are many people who are dreamers that it, today, much like Boffer this was, <laughs> was kind of joking, but was like, I'd, I'd be going on a quest to play all the RPGs. There, there would be a whole what we consider today as as distractions from working would become jobs there would be a whole industry of people who do nothing but play mega mega sized role playing games and so scott post says you know you should get a, a new renaissance period of arts music aesthetics uh, exactly there there are many people today who are too busy trying to survive to do the things that they would love to dream about in the future. Um, for example, there may be people, um, when it comes to art and music, um, how many people cannot survive, say, um, being an artist of any type because they need money to live? So we might get a, a renaissance of such music and art and sculpture or people creating new types of art. Um, in such a manner that we would never see it before. There, for example, everyone knows of someone who's got a, such a beautiful voice, but they've never used it because they're too busy working, right? They're teachers, they're waiters and waitresses, they are construction people, you know? Um, uh, Scott Post says, I think this is more of an arcano communist goal, more or less. And the thing is that it's a possibility that we may it might not be anything of those. It might not be socialist. It, it might not be what we define it today, right? It it might not quite be socialist. It might not quite be communist. It might not be capitalist at all. It might not be any of those, or it might be little bits of the rest of it, right? <laughs> Boffer says, I, I think I was joking. No, you weren't. <laughs> no, you weren't. Because <laughs> I'd be right there. Like, Boff, seriously? Oh, you're running a game in, in the middle of the Sahara? I'm in. <laughs> We're going to play some Dark Sun <laughs> right in the middle of the Sahara. I hear you. Um, this is, I like to think about what I would do if money would be no issue. I think I would become an author, which also writes RPG books and has two to three RPG groups per week. Exactly. And it, again, okay, for example, some of us feel like my, myself, I'm, I'm a hefty dude. If I could... <laughs> If, if I were a famous actor being paid to work out, that would be awesome. If I didn't have to work, would I jog or exercise or, you know, have two to three RPG groups going per, per week and then take a break and go, you know what, I think I'm going to go on a hike. Or, hey, those guys are, are all working out. I think I'll work because I love, I love martial arts. Would I do that on my downtime? Sure. And, and it seems strange because of how our society is – is designed because we have to resources are not given out equally um, across the entire board that we automatically think of like the worst parts of like socialism and communism, because in those, in those con in those constructs, there are still people above the other people, right? There's still someone in the charge that's disseminating the resources out to everyone else. It's hard to think of no one being in charge of that. So it's very, very difficult. Um, 
Boffrin says cures for diseases, the forwarding of non-profitable science and others we can't even conceive of. Exactly. There's, there are very intelligent people today who are struggling to live and don't realize the genius they have. We're, we're thinking of, of very, what we in the West would call third world countries. Um, there's lots of people and children out there trying to survive and barely have a meal but they may be the next geniuses that are able to take us to another level, um, expanding our longevity, expanding our um, our ability to to, to cure um, genetic diseases and things of that nature. So it's very difficult to think about. So um, <laughs> trying to find out some of these. Uh, <laughs> Scott Post says, yes, you could spend your days dancing in post-scarcity. Robots would be working those fields. <laughs> exactly. Um Ben says, well, theoretically, anyone could do whatever he wants in a post-scarce world, scarcity world. I imagine there would be a ton more artists. Uh, absolutely. And remember, um, it, return of philosophy is another thing. So what, but let, let's, I'm going to try to pivot this into role-playing, right? What, how do you adventure? Like, how do you open up a can of whoop-ass in, in, a, in a world where everyone has everything they want? So what I'm thinking is that value wouldn't be money. It wouldn't be gold in a, in a medieval society. It wouldn't be gold pieces and diamonds. It wouldn't be um, the next big weapon. It would be the arts. Um, and in a world filled with the arts, and I'm talking, every, you know, new discoveries, plenty of new discoveries, whether it's discoveries in philosophy, discoveries delving deep into the mind, um, delving deep into the unknown, the deepest reaches of the earth, the deepest um, uh, subterranean realms, the deepest oceans, um, traveling into uh, other worlds and planets uh, and, and creating homes for people to live there. As a matter of fact, simply just watching nature do its thing. So there would be, I'm sure there'd be plenty of people who would just love to follow the migration of birds and just follow them their, all their days through, living in the jungle and living amongst the population of marsupials and just watching them and, and watching them live. There would be people who would, to care for them and to bring back, there would, there would be scientists to bring back dead species, including dinosaurs and such, and creating the Jurassic parks of the world, you know, um, uh, uh, Vince says, even without money, there would be social capital and favors. Exactly. The, the, instead of money, people would have, like you said, favors. They would have, they would, the artist who creates the best fashions or the greatest musics would be the valued individuals. The, there might even, it's hard to think of this, but there may even be artistic pieces that affect us on such a fundamental level that we can't see our world without it. But today, the artists that create the arts that they have now, we might go, eh, it's painting, but it's not a big deal. Or that's a sculpt sculpture, but it's not a big deal. But done on a hyper level, we might have images or, you know, 3D images or sense or combinations of sense and sounds and words that might affect us on such a deep level that we are intrinsically moved by just seeing it, that we might just look at a painting of such quality that it just makes us burst into tears. And for, for us today, we can't imagine that, but a world of millions who are hyper-focused on the arts of tens of millions um, there might be things that might affect us dramatically. And so those individuals, the greatest of the great, um, the, the, not just watching a movie and seeing actors, but literally being able to maybe download their real emotional experiences and feeling it for ourselves, maybe the new way we experience, uh, life and, and uh, and, and movies and such, <laughs> um, Polaris says, this is a useful, useful tool for now. If you lived forever, what would you spend your time doing? I've used that thought experiment to, th experiment to think about things to do in my free time, learn skills, etc. cetera. Uh, I absolutely agree with you, Polora. I mean, there may be whole enclaves 
whose only job is to learn brain surgery for no other reason than to master the skill of brain surgery. And everyone involved, they're not trying to earn a paycheck. They're not trying to get greater uh, grades, um, greater grades to beat other people. They might be like, you know what? I just want to learn brain surgery. And they're like the other 5,000 people are like, yeah, I want, I want to too. And we're, Hey, let's just get together and learn brain surgery and have fun doing it and study it. And when class is over and the teachers are over, we're going to have, we're going to have lunch together and just talk about the new and new things I've learned. And the teachers who want to go to their job and do it, they're like, yeah, I want to teach you this thing. And I'm learning from you. You know, that, education would take on a new concept as well, where all of the students are literally there because they want to be there, right? No one's there because their parents made them. No teacher is there because they need the extra paycheck. No one's stressed out about getting this new curriculum. curriculum. Oh, my, my mouth doesn't work with me. Um, getting across the, 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 the new, um, <laughs> schedule of study <laughs> to, to people because the, the dean says so, right? Um, Vince says, I think it would pretty much work the same way, but the rewards would be different and the method by obtaining new equipment or skills would be different. You could make a gladiatorial arena where you could actually fight for your life, not because you were forced, but because you want to. Yep, for the thrill and the challenge. And the same could be true for dungeons or, or whatever or whatever kind. I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think that there would be people who would risk their lives because they can, uh, whether that means free diving to the bottom of, of the Marianas Trench, whether that's entering the atmosphere through like re-entry surfing, <laughs> uh, whether they're literal gladiatorial um, arenas and such. I agree with that. And I also think that the bar barter might become a new thing. So for example, yeah, orbital, orbital skydiving would, would be a thing probably. Now there may be, because of our ability to discern art, because art is such a uh, um, subjective measurement that there could be anything from fashion to uh, plays and poetry and dance and arts that we haven't even thought of yet. Um, maybe some arts done on a grand scale that those individuals and those artistic pieces would probably be the value. So for example, um, yes, machines can make us food, but there might be a chef that makes the greatest meals ever. And everyone wants to go to spend hours waiting outside of the, the, the dining rooms of the greatest chefs in the world. Um, oh yeah, I, yeah, you, <laughs> I hear you, Scott. Like, let's not forget those fetish clubs. Yeah, um, there would be a large portion of society that given, given the ability to not have to work for their deviant proclivities, would definitely dive deep into those deviant proclivities. And how terrible would that be? I mean, even in, a, in the most minor of settings, you would have people, whether they're virtual reality worlds or using robots and AI systems, you know, again, got to bring up the sorry got to bring up the pedophilia and the sadism and the sadomasochism and there would be whole chunks of of neighborhoods dedicated to just that and so yeah now mind you it depends on how legally restrictive the world would be um so for example it depends on you know, is, is this society truly free? Like, sure, as long as you're not hurting another human being, you can do whatever you want. Or has society gotten to the point where there are people who are literally dedicated themselves to eliminate this bad, these bad factions, right? Um, there, I'm sure that there would be people who would, I think there would be people unpaid in this post-scarce world who would volunteer as police officers and military and or I guess they would have a new, they, I guess they wouldn't necessarily be police. They would be like, 
neighborhood guardians or something. I think there are people who would, maybe they would blend together with say rescue services or something. I think there are people who would love to do that. Um, for example, there are people who vol who willingly work in emergency rooms. Um, there are people who willingly want to become uh, 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 paramedics and things of that nature. And I think there would be people who would travel the world for no other reason than to save other people's lives. And they might be kind of blended with law enforcement of sorts. Um, so maybe some of those fetish locations might have to hide themselves if you have a strong enough society in which they don't want to see that kind of thing. Um, again, depending on how free the world is, maybe those people were just like, nah, as long as it's a virtual reality world, I don't care what pedophiles do. They're not harming anybody. It's just, it's our all it's all artificial anyway, right? Uh, that depends on, <laughs> that That really depends. And so I bring to you, I bring want to posit to you this thing. I'm going to read a comment first before I go into it. Um, Vince says, the question would be, what if the society needs some kind of thing badly? Would you just open job pos postings for soldiers to fight those aliens and hope enough volunteers? Um you hope to get enough volunteers to risk their lives? Maybe. Um, <laughs> they'll need their Jeffrey Epstein enabler for the illegal stuff. Yeah. I mean, let's, that brings a, Vince brings up a very good question. And unfortunately, we don't know today. Like, for example, okay. An earthquake happens in a country somewhere in our world, and lots of people are injured. They die. Resources aren't there. Um, how many people would go to rebuild the communities there around our world if they were not being paid or forced to do so? Now, we do know that a sizable population of people go to places that are ravaged by earthquakes, storms, disease and that kind of thing. But how many people would volunteer to do it just because they could? It's hard to tell. I, it, it, I mean, how many people could just leave their jobs to do the right thing in their mind anyway, right? Um, how many people would say, you know what, I will get on a vehicle that can, tr I don't know, goes into upper orbit and lands anywhere in the world within an hour to help these other people to rebuild their life because it's the right thing to do? I don't know. It's, dude, that's a that's a really hard question. Like, like if you need soldiers to fight a war, how many soldiers would still exist in our own world, still soldiering? Uh, are there gonna be people even designing weapons in the first place? Um, uh, there, there is a thing known as gun porn, and there's a lot of people who love their firearms and making them better and slicker and more powerful and stuff. I think you would have people designing them, but would they design them in mass for not? Well, I guess if you had magic or machines that could replicate weapons of destruction for enough soldiers, volunteer soldiers, it's it's really hard to think about. I mean. It, it's it's a strange concept. I love thinking about it, but wow, how, how do you do it? Um, <laughs> Boffrin says, sometimes it's like trying to describe the taste of salt to someone who's never tasted it. We haven't had a post-scarce experience yet. And for, for some people who say, well, we live in a post-scarce world, the problem, the problem is that there's enough people who aren't that we still aren't quite there yet. Like some would say that those of us that live in the West, um, you know, when we, we talk about like first world problems, right? Um, <laughs> Tesla Rangers says, find a plan to the soldiers like Klingons and make them aliens, uh, allies. Now, you, you could make the, you could say that there might be whole communities of, of nothing but people devoted to one thing. For example, soldiering, is is not just the idea of trying to be like like macho or kill things. There's also a legacy to it, right? There's there are people who would want to be soldiers simply because of the legacy of their family, um, the 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 historical aspects. Today we have people who are part of a uh, ska ska um, who 
there are people today who on their free time try to keep alive medieval armory and weapons and fighting. So I believe there would might be whole communities devoted to keeping alive even historical combat things. So Vince, you might find instead of each country having their own soldiers, there might just people who are just soldiers. <laughs> you're so wrong, but you're so right. Yeah, we, we just call those people nerds. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, real life, yeah, reenactments and, and LARPers. Yeah, why wouldn't why wouldn't there be reenactors truly living, I don't know, civil war for months on end because they could, and that population might be in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, because they just want to, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, Scott Post says, so you just made me realize post-scarcity, we will create a new currency the social media like metric to the next level bragging rights would facilitate people helping each other uh yes and of course we we know how brutal social media can be as a matter of fact i'm we are literally engaging in a social media type of uh type of mechanism so that in and of itself might be a thing for example there might be people who are life broadcasting their entire lives um the uh, instagram taken to the nth degree where literally you can tune into their life 24 hours a day and there might be whole there might be thousands of people who are engaged in lifestyle porn which is a thing right there's lifestyle like hey i'm enjoying life and you can too if you just follow me and there may be people whose literal mission in life is to show other people things that they can do with their life because they're bored in this post-scarcity world. Huh, hey, have you gone down deep into the jungles of Brazil? Well, let me show you what it looks like. And I can show you the greatest places to go. And when they get there, there's other people hanging out there. They're like, yeah, these people are just hanging out here um, as the people did in the 1100s and they're enjoying themselves you too can be here and live here for months or even years they're they're willing to show you how to how the people back in the 1100s of of the, the native peoples of brazil would live right there might be uh, a strange call to go backwards in time simply because you could live in those worlds um if for no other reason than to feel what it would feel like to be say in the age of piracy or sailing there may be people whole colonies of people sailing ships um on the open seas as like a big <laughs> swarm of ships sailing on the open seas just because they could so i don't think you would um i i'm kind of with vince a little bit like like who would you get the fight? But I think physical extreme people who are willing to put themselves into extreme physical danger, I don't think that would go away. Um, as a matter of fact, I think some people would be bored and put themselves in extreme physical harm. As a matter of fact, without help through psychological means, I think some people would accidentally harm and kill themselves, much like the 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 period of jackass movies, right? Um, there's always someone on YouTube doing, there's always the next great challenge that's gonna hurt and kill someone. I, I, I think people would, would end up doing some of those things. Yeah, boxing and MMA and other full contact fighting wouldn't go away. Uh, as a matter of fact, I probably think it would accelerate uh, in terms of it's not just popularity, but I think it's, you, you might get other full contact sports or sporting uh, sporting methods. Like for example, there might be full contact teams of say 15 individuals, 15 versus 15. You might have tap in, tap out full contact sports. There might be full contact sports with weapons or in, uh, in certain locations, maybe up on top of platforms that are 30 feet above you know, the muddy ground or even above the solid earth or something. <laughs> yeah. The Kool-Aid challenge. <laughs> yeah. Um, I definitely agree with that. So it's strange to think of a post scarce world because we don't, uh, we get hints and hits hints of it. Say, I think star Trek is probably 
one of the closest things to it. But then we have the horror, like that's that's the epitome, right? Oh, Earl Grey hot, I'm done. You know, I've got a holodeck. I don't need to collect tens of thousands. I don't need to hoard anything. I can just ask for it, which is why we all walk around in jumpsuits because we don't really need other things, you know? But the horror of that is the matrix, right? <laughs> it's sure, we have everything we want because we're plugged in as batteries. Um, or I'm going to give you everything you want, whether you want it or not. Uh, horror of that thing. Or the horrors of our real world thoughts. It's going to just be the worst elements of communism or socialism, you know? <laughs> yeah, the horror of of people walking around in jumpsuits. Hell yeah. So anyway, I I think these 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 talks I think span far greater than an hour. Um because what do you do? How do you make an adventure? I think I'm sure Vince is sitting back like drumming his fingers and going, God, I just can't picture it. Like what who, who do you fight? What do you do? How do you roll dice in a tabletop RPG where everyone's got what they want? Um I think there would be, I think you would have the same encounters. I think their motivations would be different. I think you would still have espionage and uh, I think you would have, you would still have physical confrontations with people. I think some of it might be rather strange, uh, you know, people having physical combat with each other just because they could. You know, uh, uh, Balfrin says, instead of wealth, you seek knowledge. And if medicine kept pace, it would go very extreme. Uh, I, I agree with that as well. There might the the idea of full contact sports with bladed weapons may be a thing if medicine is able to save those people's lives. And those people engaging in those full contact sports with swords and knives and spears, uh, gladiatorial arenas might do it because there is a chance however slim that they might die and they might go for it because they know it much like free climbing and much like free diving and people base jumpers and such. There's the, the thrill itself, no matter how low it is of possibly dying, you know, orbital skydiving <laughs> Tesla Ranger said is it's like, mm, uh, maybe people might do it. And so if for no other reason than out of boredom, um, sure, why not? I, I think I think in their own minds, they wouldn't call it boredom. Uh, Boffrin says, and restore lost limbs and organs, exactly. And you, you may have, a, a given a post-scare society, we may have an accelerated industry and so many other things. Um, yep, and Dead Man, of course, says, or cortical stacks making people immortal. Um, there's there is no reason for people not to jump off of buildings and hope that they don't die because if they if their body gets crushed you can just upload their brains to another body and they say wow that hurt but okay <laughs> oh you guys are sarcastic Pelora says you can't you can, you can die driving to work I still don't find that exciting <laughs> yeah oh man. Tesla uh, says, oh, you can just kill your opponent because his mind can just be downloaded into a new body. And then you get things like murder addiction. So before we get out of here, I'm going to, to, to suggest to you in world building, pick whatever game is your favorite. It could be Dungeons and Dragons. It could be some science fiction game. Pick it. Pick it up, right? Now imagine the majority of things in that world exist because humanity wants it to exist, that people have chosen for it to be that way. So take, take a game like Traveler or Star Wars or whatever game you find, and you want to make your own setting. I, I contend to you to reimagine that world, whether it's got aliens and robots and whatever the case may be. And instead of aliens literally being aliens from other worlds, they are they are actually humanity, which has chosen to live that way. Um, either immediately, meaning they've downloaded or genetically created bodies for them to live in, or or genetically modified themselves, or humanity has spread to the stars or spread amongst other dimensions so much that they no longer resemble humanity as we know it 
but that's where they came from. So yeah, Tesla Ranger saying D and D monsters, demi humans only exist because humans genetically engineered them. Exactly. Could you imagine? Just imagine a world in which elves and dwarves, oh, and half orcs and 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 dragonborn. You can't tell me that if you could create a dragonborn body, that we won't have thousands of RPG players put themselves into a dragonborn body you can't, or tiefling body. You can't tell me they wouldn't do that if you could afford it. it, it that's a thing, right? You know, the, the ogre that's t that's lives on the hill hillside, yeah, he used to live in town and it just wants to be a bully, right? Uh, the fiends that live in the nine hells only exist there because we made it that way. Like, yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a pit fiend because I want to be one. F you guys, right? <laughs> Yep. Uh, Puller says, I'd rock a tiefling body. Exactly. Tesla Ranger says, I've seen people who have gotten surgery to give themselves elf ears. Listen, if we could modify our entire bodies, I, I think, <laughs> yeah, or cyber yourself up to, to the edge of psychoses. Yes. Uh, I think there would be plenty of people who would, I don't know, become centaurs. Um, real People who would real life make themselves into furries. Uh, like not a furry suit, real life anthropomorphic creatures. I, yeah, that would be a thing. So could you imagine a, a role-playing setting where it's completely alien and then you you turn the next page and it's like, oh yeah, by the way, all that is real because people want it to be. <laughs> Let's not step in that genetic puddle. Yeah, a puddle of what? What is it, Balfron? What is, What puddle is that? <laughs> anyway, guys, thank you for joining me. Thank you for deep diving with me on on, on these talks. Some of them are really, really bizarre, but <laughs> yeah, it's very strange. Of course, tomorrow is Third Pillar Thursday, the third pillar of exploration. Everyone take care. Thank you very much for you guys just, just jumping in and having fun with me.